testimony taken. They're reviewing the petitions and the supporting uh, data that we submitted with that, and they will have a vote, and if the uh, vote in each of the conditions is a majority, it then goes to the um, head of Lara, who uh, has the final say to approve or disapprove. I would, I would say that we had this uh, situation in 2014, 15, where we had submitted a petition to add autism to the list of uh, conditions. We had to sue Lara because they wouldn't place it into or give us a public hearing on it. We won that lawsuit. It required uh, Lara to give us a hearing. We had a hearing. It was one of the most really compelling events of my uh, legal career. All these people came out of the woodwork and told their stories about how cannabis had helped their children or someone in their life uh, who had autism. And uh, <coughs> even though I believe that the panel that we were speaking to was not inclined to vote that in, in our favor, they did that day, I think, just moved by the testimony. And then, of course, they sent it to Mike Zimmer, who was the head of LAR at the time, and he found some silly reasons to uh, deny it. One of which was that the children were using you know, concentrates, which was illegal at the time, or something crazy like that. But we're gonna, we're gonna get autism past this time, and I encourage anyone that's interested in these issues uh, to get involved. It, uh, you know, these are the, it expands the patient base for the uh, industry. All right, so I was gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the uh, MMFLA for a moment. I, uh, it's a lot, a lot of material, um, but I wanted to talk about one thing in particular, um, and I would open up questions uh, if people have specific questions for a moment or two before we introduce uh, our next Attorney General. So, as people know, the, the, there are facilities that are currently working in the emergency rules, or this temporary emergency rules zone. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, there are, um, it's a whole new world. It's a very uh, unusual, and, and from, from where we were just a year ago. And I say a whole new world because the rights of the uh, enforcement officers is um, that of an administrative function through the uh, licensing agency, and they are uh, entitled to come in and inspect and examine and interact with, and, um, and you should expect that for those people that are getting involved or are involved. And um, there's also some requirements people may not be aware of, but um, if you are operating as a uh, temporary existing facility and something happens, there's a robbery or some incident where something happens, there's a theft by an employee or something, you have a duty to report. A lot of people may not know this, they're operating. And failing to report as it goes may be something that causes sanctions or may impede your ability to uh, be granted the license. But, uh, so we had this situation happen, we represent uh, few people that are currently operating on the, uh, you know, they've applied through the state, they're operating um, according to state authorization as a provisioning center. And I just want to describe the scenario that happened. At the, at the end of the story, is it's, it's temporarily positive. But, so there'd been a robbery at the place and uh, we notified the uh, Lara of that. And of course they want to ins inspect immediately. They have not done an inspection before. We are literally the first inspection known as any idea what's going to happen. My instincts as a criminal defense lawyer was to get our clients on the phone and I'd say I read them the riot act, which was, you know, no one's talking to anyone if they're going to be there tomorrow and, you know, where the cannabis may have come from is not of interest to anyone. They shouldn't be asking any questions about that and we will be there to not let those questions be answered. Any of the records that you have and think you're keeping good records, well, you know, they may not have to be there in case they want to look at them. At some point you may be required to, but there's no absolute guidance right now what those records should look like. So let's not you know, keeping and making confessions if we don't need to that could be used against us later. This is just the criminal defense instance kicking in. And everybody understood that going in and um, we really didn't know what to expect. But it turns out they show up and, and, and just like our um, kind of cautious, uh, you know, slow to speak, waiting for them to act, they were doing the same thing. They, they, they didn't really know what they were doing either and they admitted this and there's a lot of uncertainty. Some of the exchange of what took place of us trying to gather information of what was, you know, what was their concerns, what were they looking for, the question was asked, what's, what's the amount of marijuana that you might be able to have on site during this emergency rule phase? And they said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I just, you know, you realize like this is the world, this is how it is right now. It's total crazy. Like there is, you know, the, that's not gonna be forever. This is just this emergency rules phase and that will never be an answer that could ever be given again until you're either denied of the license, granted the license, and, or the um, rules have become more specific. But, so that that's just, I thought that's an interesting, and, and, and even worse, we have a situation now um, where some individuals were operating under the emergency rules in the city of Detroit, and there was a uh, ancillary um, situation that drew uh, law enforcement attention to it, and and, uh, and there was an interaction that somehow spilled over into this state licensed authorized facility that doesn't have a limitation of the amount of marijuana they're allowed to have on site, and uh, all of that was um, seized, and it's just an interesting dynamic of how this plays out because our partners in getting back the marijuana, the concentrates and the money is going to be Lara against the city of Detroit. It's just a fascinating time the way these things are kind of lining up right now. And um, I mean, um, the lack of information, for example, known of the Detroit Police Department when they did the seizure uh, is um, obvious. And their justifications for whatever they were doing are on old school public health code, marijuana is illegal, not this facility is licensed, not just by the state of Michigan, but the city of Detroit, and they can have as much marijuana as they want there. So it's interesting times, uh, nonetheless. And um, for those that are interested in the business, I think it's something to think about, um, even though I'm speaking of this in a very um, <coughs> lighthearted way, I think there's a lot of real concerns that people should have. I'm not trying to try to scare anyone, and I, I think that there's methods by proper representation and the formation of your structure where you can really limit your liabilities. And that's one of the things we've been focusing on is when you set up your business and your entity to make sure that you've, uh, your personal liability is limited. There's certain entity formations that can assist in this and um, have been proven as um, prophylactic from situations that have come out of other states that are being audited right now um, and the uh, representation and, and the outcomes of those from a legal perspective give us some insight as to how and what you can do if you're setting up a company to try to insulate yourself and these things are you know real time minutes coming out of what's happening well, you know and the issue that I'm talking about is of course the 280e and how uh, Businesses are going to deal with the uh, paying taxes for the marijuana uh, industry, and, and uh, that is broken down into different sectors of where your liability may be, and uh, and there, there's developing strategies of what you can do in your business setup. The you know where where your uh, you know how much square footage you have at your provisioning center versus how much employees and efforts and, and investment you have at the processing center. There are things that you can do in strategy that can be developed and it's all based on the corporate setup and uh, I would suggest that if you're going into the business or you're in the business that you check that first and make sure that these things that I'm talking about, your personal assets, your um, personal bank accounts, your wife's assets, the bank accounts that they, they may use, your spouse, that those things are, are thought about because if you are uh, audited and the federal government <coughs> finds you in fault for not properly filing your taxes and penalizes you, the way that they will ensure that they get the money, they will seize your assets or they'll go after your personal bank accounts. And depending on that corporate structure that you're in, that you are in, uh, it, it, that, that will uh, dictate the outcome. All right, so that's the only uh, bits of information I want to talk about. I could take a couple of questions if uh, anyone has any about the MMFLA. Seeing no hands, okay, go ahead, yes, back there. You have all the answers. Why, why would I? Well, I don't have all the answers because I, I rely on you with the law to right, give good. me the answers. And so my biggest question is, how do we protect ourselves while we're under temporary rule and we're transporting product? Well, there's that's an issue. I, I don't know that I can give you an exact answer on that because the the. I would not let anyone answer the question of where did this marijuana come from, you know, a client business owner. And I don't think they have a right to ask. And it's kind of an oddity. So the idea that where is it coming from, if it's being brought there or transported is, is what you're talking about, being brought to a facility. I mean, the, you know, where it's going is, is not for discussion in that if, if someone is stopped. 
But but for transferring marijuana, I mean, the, the safest way is to do it in a manner that is is compliant with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Is it can't right? If you're allowed, you got six cards, you can possess 15 ounces of usable marijuana, more in other formats. Um, but, you know, the marijuana infused products have a different measurement of, of weights and whatnot per ounce of uh, flour. And um, I would, even though it's not necessarily required, uh, I would certainly take steps to make it not known that someone is transferring marijuana. You know, I, I mean, my, my, my advice from day one has always been, even though you have a card, you don't want to have to use it. Better that you did not come up and you have to pull it out. You know, pull it out if you need to, but you know, don't leave the house thinking that I'm smelling like marijuana and I got marijuana in my car and it's laying around and the police pull me over and just pull my car out. That is not a good strategy. Much better to, you know, it's, it's terrible. I mean, this is the world we live in. And, and, you know, we get the right attorney general. We get Dana as our next attorney general. We probably won't have to worry about these things. But this is the world we live in and that the uh, marijuana in a vehicle is going to be a, uh, I mean, it's, it's unclear, man. It's going to be a search of a vehicle. That's, that's what it's going to be. And the questions are going to be asked. If someone's going to get detained, it's going to be a whole thing that you want to avoid. So, to try to do avoid that, um, take whatever steps you can to conceal the smell of marijuana. You know, I even suggest you, uh, you know, take some time and go through the process. Do like a you know a fake walkthrough of like getting pulled over the car and be aware that you're going to be asked questions and how you're going to answer them. Just to be aware, make sure you have your papers in order here. Kiss of death is not you know, having a license plate or a tag expired. They're going in your car no matter what. So before you even get in the car, number one, you make sure all your documents are in order. There's no reason for them to detain you any longer than they would need to for the reason they may have pulled you over. And do everything you can to reduce the smell. A lot of times, people in our community don't realize that they're walking around with it on their clothes because they come from a grow room. You know, they're around the patient. They you know, they're, they're smoking. They, you know, they get used to it. It's not a thing, but you know, officer get out of a car walking up to a vehicle, they're, they're, lo they're looking for it most of the time, and even though they may not even smell it, they may suggest it, that they smell it, because they know there's a lot of patients and people that smoke marijuana, and they will wait for a reaction. So, um, transporting, take steps to avoid it, and if you're talking about people that are transporting to facilities, the safest way, even though it's irrational, you know, they have not more than you're allowed to possess, and that you could make a claim of immunity. Police wouldn't know about it, but if they do, for some reason, get into your trunk, pull it out of your, uh, you know, a um, non-smell duffel bag of some kind or whatever, uh, or backpack, you know, you have cards and you can have immunity. If they arrest you, they shouldn't arrest you, and you know, you've got a, you got a, you got immunity, and you've got a defense. But that's that's is that, that's some that's the best answer I could give for that. Is that somewhat? Uh, it's a great answer under MMA. I want to transport three pounds to my facility as a licensee operating under Rule 19, am I no longer under the jurisdiction of MMA? Well, what I'm saying to you is that the encounter itself, you know, should be known to the law enforcement community. If, if you had that situation, you had three pounds, you pulled out the verification that you are licensed, I mean, I just, it's just going to be hard for them to walk away, you know. And once they have possession of the marijuana, they're not going to want to give it back. That's all I'm saying. And what you're talking about is the grayest of gray areas, really. Because the on-site facility inspection does not have bothered, but they did not account for how it gets there. Right? I mean, that's what you're asking. Like, there's no, there's no, so I would just, def I mean, the safest way, the safest <coughs> way is to default back to what we know and has been tested, which is the MMA. I know it's not, I'm not even talking about that. You're asking about the MMFLA. But there's not an answer specifically. I mean, I, you know, the example that I was giving about this place in Detroit that's operating under temporary rules that had their marijuana taken by the Detroit police, I believe we're right. But who wants to litigate that? You know what I mean? What client of anyone wants to be the one that, you know, is arguing to get their cannabis back and their money back that, you know, there's no limit to what, you know, the amount that it is, and we're not even trying to justify it. And, and, and the concept of the government now, or the police giving this back, even though I think we're right, is 
is a, is a, you know, it's a tough road to hoe, so to speak. 